Um, Thank you. I'll now pass the chair over to Amara Thornton, who's going to uh, get, carry on with the, uh, the good work this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, and I'm uh, delighted to be here this afternoon to chair this section of the event. Um, I'm a historian of archaeology, and uh, my research really centers on the history of archaeology and archaeological collections histories in various parts of the British Empire and beyond. And I'm really pleased to be able to chair um, this section of the event, which focuses on connections between Britain and the Caribbean, colonialism, and the legacies and representation of empire in the UK's heritage landscape. Um, just as a reminder, there will be a Q&A session session at the end of each paper. I'm sure you're well acquainted with the format um, having had two papers already, but if anyone would like to uh, ask a question, please type it into the chat function on Zoom and I'll ask them at the end. Um, also, if you're tweeting about the event, uh, the hashtag is uh, intertwined histories. So feel free to use that. And it's my absolute privilege to introduce um, Catherine Hall to give the first paper. Um, Catherine Hall is an Emerita Professor of History and Chair of the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at University College London. Her work has focused on the relation between Britain and its empire and includes the books uh, Civilizing Subjects, Macaulay and Son, and uh, Legacies of British Slave Ownership. Uh, between 2009 and 2015, she was the principal investigator on the ESRC AHRC project Legacies of British Slave Ownership, um, which seeks to put slavery back into British history and has a wonderful website. Um, her new book will be Making Racial Capitalism, Edward Long's History of Jamaica. So Catherine, um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, I think I'm supposed to be there now, but I'm speaking, but I've still got Amara on my screen. How, what's everybody else got on their screen? Hello? Hi, Catherine. Sorry, Have go you ahead. got a PowerPoint on your... No, I'm not using a PowerPoint. I'm just gonna okay. speak. Okay, I can see you, so um, maybe... Can other people see me? Maybe it's okay. Yes, so all, um, all attendees will just see you, Catherine, so please. Okay, do. fine. Thank you. So uh, I decided, um, I know you have lots of pictures already, and I thought in this brief uh, contribution that I can make this afternoon, I wouldn't use a PowerPoint. So I hope you'll be prepared to just listen to me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I think what I've got to say follows on. Um, there are just so many connections between uh, what I have to say, what Adele has said, and what Richard's been saying about Liverpool. So, but I come from the university sector rather than the uh, museum sector, uh, but, um, a part of the university that's always been very preoccupied with public education. So the project that I've been involved with for the last 10 years and more, the legacies of British slave ownership and the legacies of slavery, uh, is deeply committed to both doing research and making that research publicly available. And our website, which Amara mentioned, has already had over 2 million visitors. So I do recommend it to you if you've never looked at it. Well, when working on issues of diversity, inclusion and social justice in the heritage sector, it's very clear that this means working on questions of race. And I want to draw attention today in this brief contribution to the importance of the long history of Britain and its empire and the ways in which this deeply affected British domestic life. The understanding once was that empire had a huge effect on the colonies, but not on in, uh, Britain itself. Now we know, thanks to much historical work which has been done, the ways in which empire impacted on British politics and British people 
and how Britons benefited from empire, not least in the notion that white people were entitled to rule over colonized subjects, most of whom were brown and black. So racial thinking and racial hierarchies became part of British society centuries ago. Uh, but this is not a past that has disappeared. It lives on into the present, as we've seen so dramatically in the recent period with the Windrush scandal, and then even more recently, the scale of uh, minority ethnic deaths um, associated with, with COVID. So this raises the question, who can really be Britain? Who, who can really be British? Who can really belong? And I wonder whether I should say also who can really be English in the context of today's English, Scottish and Welsh strong national identities and the uh, potential breakup of the UK, which we're facing. Well, I want to make three points. My focus is on Jamaica because that's the area I've been working on for a long time. So my first point is the long history of entanglement between Britain and Jamaica. And when I use the term entanglement, I want to emphasize that that's, it's not really quite the right word because they are indeed very entangled histories, but always in the context of a set of power relations associated with colonialism and now with the period after colonialism. So always a relation of power and therefore entanglements where one side has a great deal more power than the other. So the connection between Britain and Jamaica started on the plantations in the mid 17th century. And I'm going to briefly talk about that. And secondly, by how at the time of emancipation in 1834, many Britons were involved with the slavery business in its many dimensions, not least, of course, through the consumption of sugar, which had become a basic part of the British diet, particularly through the sweet cup of tea. So an increasing proportion of the population were implicated in innumerable different, different ways in the slavery business. But my third point is, that emancipation didn't bring freedom to the enslaved, rather it brought new forms of labor and political control, justified by the need for the notion of civilizing people of a different color. And this history, unfortunately, has continued right into the 20th century. And I can't focus on now beyond pointing to it, but of course there is absolutely masses of work telling us about that in so many different ways. Well, first then, my short account of the conquest of Jamaica. So the connection between uh, Britain and Jamaica goes back to 1655, when Oliver Cromwell wanted to tackle the power of the Spanish empire and its domination of the Western world. By the 1650s, the King, Charles I, had been executed. Scotland and Ireland had been subjugated by Cromwell and he was in command. And he thought the time had come to tackle Spanish and of course Catholic domination of the Atlantic. So the intention of the expedition he sent out was to take Hispaniola from the Spanish, but that failed and Jamaica became a kind of consolation prize. It took five years to defeat the Spanish, but by the time of the restoration of Charles II in 1660, the English were in control of the island and a civil government was established. The first colonists in Jamaica were the officers and soldiers who'd survived. Many, of course, had died, and the officers were given land. Charles II and his brother, the Duke of York, were very keen on the idea of developing the empire and extending crown control over it to improve their revenues. Their deep involvement in the Royal African Company and the provision of African captives to the Caribbean has been well documented. Barbados had been experimenting with sugar from the 1620s and the growing market for sugar in Europe 
made it clear to the colonists that their future lay with a sugar colony, which is what they set about establishing in Jamaica. So Jamaica was to be organized in the interests of the mother country, in the expectation of an expansion of British wealth and power. And that was what the colonists would contribute to in the process of making their own fortunes. The indigenous population in Jamaica, the Taino people, had scarcely survived by the time of English settlement. So the major problem that the colonists faced was how to provide labor for the plantations. Barbadian planters had, additionally, had initially made much use of convicts, prisoners from the Civil War, white indentured servants, but their mortality rates in the tropics were very high. And it soon became apparent that African labor survived much better, hence the increasing demand for captives from Africa. It was then necessary to define them differently from white servants. And this was the basis of the organization of the slave codes, which began from the, 16, uh, from the late uh, 17th century, making a clear distinction between people who were described as white with a capital W and people who were described as Negro with a capital N. So the colonists preferred to use the terminology of white and Negro, that white and Negro meant free and unfree. And I think that's one of the sources of the ways in which Englishmen came to think of themselves as white. People often say now that, you know, white is a kind of, it's not a category that's there. People don't think of it but they certainly did think about it in the 17th century. And it was used to define their difference from black people and to assert their freedom. So what happened in Jamaica in the late 17th century was the formation of a racial order, which was organized through property. Basically it was white people who owned property. It was white people who had political rights, the freeborn, Englishmen, they called themselves. They established racial hierarchies on the plantations with white overseers. Black men were trained to be skilled and the women were for the most part were the enslaved field laborers. In the law, there was a completely different system, a legal system for those who were white and those who were enslaved. And crucially important in relation to reproduction, the babies of enslaved women belonged to the owner, not to the woman who had born the child. And feminist historians have worked on this a lot in recent years, establishing how important it is to think of this terrible wound and harm associated with slavery, of the, the stealing, basically, of babies from their mothers. Then there were the cultural distinctions, who was defined as savage, and that was, of course, Africans, and who was defined as civilized, the whites. Well, this history, I have to, be say, have to say, the early history of colonialism, and Jamaica is only one example, is not what most kids have learned in school. What tends to be taught in schools when questions of race are raised at all is that the British abolished slavery, that it's part of our great history. And race is taught through the US and civil rights. So it's as if race and slavery don't belong in Britain. It's not part of our domestic world. And our project has tried to tackle that whole issue, to tackle the issue of how slavery does belong to Britain. It's not something that we can say it didn't happen here. It didn't happen here domestically on a great scale as it did in the Americas. But of course, it brought great wealth to Britain uh, and power and ideas about race and difference from the 17th century onwards.
So 10 years ago, we established the project at University College, the legacies of British slave ownership. And we wanted to challenge this narrative of the non-existence of race in Britain and the generous act of abolition and demonstrate Britain's own historic involvement in slavery. So our initial research concerned the 20 million pounds, which was paid in compensation to the slave owners when their human property, enslaved men and women across the British Caribbean and Mauritius and the Cape were emancipated in 1834. This compensation, this 20 million, was paid by British taxpayers in order to get the consent of the slave owners who were a very influential political lobby in Britain to this, to emancipation going through parliament. So in our database, we've identified the 46,000 claims that were made on that 20 million pounds. And very importantly, nearly half that money uh, went to 4,000 people who were resident in Britain. So these were the resident slave owners or people who were benefiting from slave ownership in Britain. And they were living all over the country particularly high proportion in relation to the population in Scotland. 25% of the people who got compensation were women. And these people compensated were paid a proportion of what was deemed to be the market value of the 300,000 enslaved people who had supposedly been freed. Each slave owner had to apply for compensation with details of the enslaved people they owned and very detailed records were kept. And that's made it possible, they're all in the National Archive, that's made it possible for us to do the research and put all this material into our database. So at that moment, people who had been bought and sold were now for the last time priced as commodities and the money went to the, to the slave owners, even though the whole basis of the campaign against slavery was that it was immoral to hold people as property. So we investigated as far as we could what they did with the money. They invested it in a whole range of economic and cultural activities, from building railways and developing merchant banks to buying artworks, some of which are now in our national collections, building castles, refurbishing country houses, some of which of course, the National Trust now own and have been the subject of great rows recently after the National Trust's report on their connections, that the connections that their property has with slavery and empire. Same with English heritage. So these slave owners made a significant contribution to the building of modern Britain through their involvement in the economy. And they were also active politically in defending West Indian interests after emancipation, and particularly in the development of indenture, which was the new system which replaced slavery. It was a form of unfree labor, but not chattel slavery, which was crucial to the expansion of sugar production in Guyana and Trinidad and brought in hundreds of thousands of South Asian people. And that's the origins of the very mixed populations in Guyana and Trinidad. It's not just slavery, it's also indenture. The slave owners also wrote histories and fictions and poetry, which re-articulated racial hierarchies for the post-slavery period. Black people, they argued, were still in need of civilization and must be subject to white control. They also invested their capital, both human and mobile, in the development of the new colonies of white settlement in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So we now have very interesting collaborative projects going on particularly in Australia, about the legacies of compensation and slave ownership in different uh, colonies in Australia. 
Emancipated men and women, meanwhile, struggled with their varied conditions of limited freedom. Our subsequent research has focused on the Britons who owned property and land and people in the Caribbean from the mid 18th century to 1833, opening up the long histories of white families who lived off the exploitation of enslaved people over many generations. The transmission of wealth from the Caribbean to Britain was an important source for the building of an in infrastructure which was crucial to the development of industrial capitalism. As Eric Williams in his famous book, Capital and Slavery wrote many years ago. So our aim has been to provide unequivocal evidence, hard evidence which cannot be denied of the ways in which white Britons have benefited from slavery and how the practices of racial injustice are historically embedded in British society and culture. And then of course, to move into how the past lives on in the present, how these racial hierarchies are still constantly reconfigured and reworked. Our database has provided masses of evidence for genealogists, local historians, amateur historians, academic historians, school kids, teachers, all sorts, and been particularly interest interesting, I think, for people who've been tracing their ancestors and who have often discovered very shocking things. They may have thought they were purely black and they discovered they're descended from uh, white people, slave owners, or they may think they were purely white and they discover there's mixed heritage in their families. So the entanglement across uh, sexuality, across the sexual economy of the Caribbean has been a very, very important aspect of the upsetting, I'm glad to say, of any simple division between those who are black and those who are white. None of this stopped after emancipation, the heavy involvement in what we call the slavery business, all the other ways in which people in Britain were involved in provisioning the plantations, in building the ships, in providing the financial uh, credit, dozens and dozens and dozens of ways, thousands of people, were involved in the, the wider business of the slavery, uh, of slavery, uh, making nails, making fetters, making, uh, refining the sugar, you know, on and on and on we can go about the, the ways in which the slavery economy ran into uh, the British domestic economy. So none of that stopped after emancipation when British capital moved into cotton and fed the massive expansion of US slavery in the South and the extensive use, as I've mentioned, of indentured labor on the tea plantations in India and the sugar and cotton plantations in the Caribbean. So the long history of how that goes on, I can't talk about here, but I could give you many, many examples of this continuing entanglement and inequality across the centuries from the 17th century right into the 21st century and our own times. So let me leave it there and give time for some discussion. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was great. Um, and um, speaking as someone who's got partially Caribbean heritage, it was particularly um, meaningful. But um, we have a question um, to start us off. Um, Abigail wants to know um, if you can say something about, um, with the Legacies of British Slave Ownership database, how many um, of the people who were compensated were of mixed race, or can you make that determination? Sorry, how many of them were? How many of the, um, the compensation uh, recipients were of mixed race, or can you make yeah. that well, that's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, it's very, very difficult to say that because the records don't usually record color. 
But what we know is that, I mean, our focus uh, up to now has been very much on the British slave owners because we wanted to demonstrate British involvement. Now, of course, there were masses of people in the Caribbean who got slave compensation too. And very interestingly, in the Caribbean, nearly 40, nearly 45% of the people who received compensation were women. And we are, well, we're certain that a large number of them were people of mixed heritage because they were the women who were the illegitimate children of white men and enslaved women. They were often freed by their fathers or manumitted at some point, and they became a very important presence, particularly in urban life in the Caribbean. So in Jamaica, for example, both in the two main towns, Spanish town and Kingston, there are large numbers of independent brown women acting as hoteliers, as, ho as brothel, brothel keepers, as retailers, as nurses, like Mary Seacole, for example, um, and owning, um, without any difficulty, owning enslaved people themselves. And some of the most fascinating findings actually have been about the ways in which in the Caribbean, uh, the children who'd been freed of, um, by a white father might own their half brothers and sisters themselves. So you've got these extraordinary kinship relations where some are free and some are unfree, but literally within the same households and trying to think about what those, quite what those personal relationships must have been like. Of course, this is where the fiction writers um, can do such wonderful work. And, you know, the thing about this whole subject is that, I mean, the combination of the work that visual artists do, that filmmakers do, that writers do, that dancers do, that musicians do, I mean, we have such a wealth of different ways of thinking about this period of history, as well as, you know, um, very concrete empirical things like our database. If I, if I shared my screen now, I could just show you the, um, the database in case people aren't familiar with it. Please do. If I can. I've also put a link to it in the chat as well. Uh, it's not there. Oh, I'm, I'm afraid I may be very involved in the making of a database, but my capacity to be technologically savvy is extremely limited. I'm not going to mess about trying to do it. Um, well, I've put, I've put a link to it in the chat. Thank so you so much. People can um, access it there, but we've got time for one more question if we're really fast. And um, that is, um, we have Laura who's, who's asking who paid for the compensation? Was it taxpayer funded? And if so, how long did it take for the debt to be paid? Well, actually there's, there's quite a lot of argument about this. The money was, um, was raised by the government issuing bonds and the money came through the Rothschilds. We do know that, but interestingly, all the detailed documentation about that has been lost. So people would really, really like to know more about what happened because different groups made bids, but it went to the Rothschilds. So it took years and years and years and decades and decades and centuries to pay it off. But what's complicated about that is that the way in which the finance was organized, all kinds of different uh, elements got packaged into the interest on those loans over years. So, um, I mean, there is an argument that, which may be right, that it wasn't finally paid off until 2015. What is absolutely clear is that British taxpayers paid for it because particularly in the 19th century, the, the interest and loans were paid for by taxes, uh, particularly on sugar. Um, which was, a, of course, an absolutely crucial part of working class diet. Uh, 
um, Sidney Mintz in his famous book, Sugar and Slavery, Sweetness and Sugar, uh, talks about how, you know, the tragedy really of enslaved populations producing sugar, which then enabled white populations, the proletarian population in Britain to survive on very poor diet because sugar gave, it gives strength. So the numbers of people that lived on tea, which of course comes from India, tea, sugar, and bread in the 19th century, deeply shocking, one of the aspects of white poverty, which links us back to this question that Adele raised at the beginning this afternoon, the intimate connections between these different histories of black and white people. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, it's been an absolute privilege to have you um, talk today. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Um,